Well, thank you for coming to the Power of Art uh, panel discussion tonight. Each one will uh, make opening remarks and then an open discussion between the panelists will have for a while. And then we're going to go ahead and open it up to the audience. If you have a question, we basically just want you to come up to the microphone. You can just make a little line and ask a question. And you can stand there if you'd like to uh, maybe ask a follow-up or you can just down there. All right, well, uh, again, thank you so much for, for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. We also are going to be uh, taking uh, some notes in terms of your evaluation, so please be sure to fill those out. We have another panel discussion coming up on October 25th, uh, and that one will be more on hate crime, actually, uh, focused on, uh, on hate crime. So you all will have, uh, if you pick up a brochure or a flyer from, from tonight's, uh, uh, tonight's panel discussion, one of those is attached to that, so you'll see, you'll see what's going on and, uh, in the end of the month, at the end of the month. All right, so I am going to allow Sue, Dr. Dr. Everly, to uh, start with uh, a historical perspective. So please welcome our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, well, I'm going to be giving a historical perspective of the last 200 years, and I have 10 minutes to do that in, so I better talk fast. <laughs> I'd like to start then. Whoops. With the Romantics. If we could move that one back, that'd be great. Thank you. I know this looks like an impressionist image, but it really is Delacroix's liberty leading the people. Uh, it's that, um, what do you call it, screen door effect, you know, that, that is sometimes seen in digital imagery. We associate images of resistance, uh, images that reflect the power of political art with romanticism. And it is in the romantic period at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century that we first see uh, this tradition. It's a tradition of social, political, and religious criticism. And the nature of the artist began to change in the Romantic period, so he's no longer seen as merely a craftsman, but rather he or she is an outsider, an alienated person who is, as an outsider, above and beyond society, and thus capable of criticizing society. So the artist takes on the role of a priest or a prophet. Uh, again, no longer a mere decorator, no longer a tool or a slave of a particular regime. And we have artists such as Blake, as well as Delacroix, uh, who resisted uh, common movements that they felt were uh, somehow uh, problematic. Uh, many artists like Blake and Turner were anti-slavery artists, and so they did abolitionist works. This may at first glance look like a pretty landscape, but in fact it's the slave ship. And Turner shows us what happens during a storm at sea. Uh, almost all car captains would unload cargo, except this is human cargo that must be unloaded. So in the middle of this roiling sea, there are little hands and feet and uh, bodies that are floating in the bottom. Other artists follow that same tradition begun by the Romantics in the early 20th century and late 19th century. Artists like Katie Kollwitz also looked at the inequities in life, and this is her Weaver's Riot from uh, 1897. She sided with the poor, with women, with the disadvantaged, and did paintings and prints uh, that showed the problems of society and how to correct them. Many, many artists, particularly around World War I, emphasized war and its horrors. And I like this portrait of Ernest Kirchner. This is a self-portrait. Kirchner was in the medical corps during World War I. He was not wounded, but he chose to show himself with a mutilated hand because as an artist, he was no longer able to paint in the same way after the war. So he was so moved by that, uh, that event. We tend to like to think of the power of art uh, is used for good, is used for art of resistance. And yet, when you stop to think about it, propaganda that is promoting a particular regime, promoting the status quo, is quite popular and very effective. 
Uh, we prefer not to think that perhaps the Roman Empire used propaganda, but even their architecture was a symbol of uh, their grandeur, uh, their power, and their control over the people. Uh, the Colosseum was built partly in order to give people an entertainment, uh, you know, make people think about their own needs rather than the needs of others. Louis XIV in the 17th century was a master at propaganda and perpetuating his own image as the Sun King. He once said, I am La France, you know, uh, I am the country itself. And of course, Adolf Hitler managed to do that also. This is one of the sculptures by Arno Breckner, uh, who was a key sculptor uh, in the Nazi regime. That idea of the powerful, sword-bearing, Greek-looking hero uh, fit the Aryan ideal. And so these sculptures then certainly did promote a particular image. We may think that Americans are somehow separate from that uh, propagandistic style of art, but Norman Rockwell, of all people, is often considered a great propaganda artist. And he did a series of, of illustrations on the four freedoms, uh, and here, the freedom of speech. He uses many of the same technical elements as Louis XIV's artists and uh, Nazi artists. And even Goya's 3rd of May, 1808, which is usually uh, placed in texts as a good example of protest art, was in fact done when uh, Goya was trying to once again get into the good graces of Fernando VII, who had just come back to the throne in Spain. Um, he had to prove himself to be uh, a French-hating, Spaniard-loving patriot, in spite of the fact that in previous years he had actually sided with Napoleon. Uh, he was sympathetic to the Spanish cause, but at the same time he appreciated Napoleonic law and Napoleon's attempt to bring in a constitution. So here he's trying to re-ingratiate himself with the new old Spanish king. Perhaps one of the ways that art of protest can be successful is if the art has the weight of the artist behind it. And Picasso's Guernica probably was one of the most successful political art pieces simply because it had the strength of Picasso's fame and success behind it. I have to say that I'm a little bit of a skeptic when it comes to the power of art. Uh, and while I enjoy political art and I think it's very important, I don't know exactly how much it can change the world. Uh, Leon Golub, who did his interrogation series of mercenaries uh, in the 18, I'm sorry, the 1990s, uh, was speaking to issues that we still have today, and I'd like to read a quote by Golub. He said, when a regime doesn't or cannot use its, con its central political organ of control, that is national troops or the police, to suggest a particular political or economic policy, it must then turn to paid goons and thugs who have no national idealism or loyalty. Uh, a very appropriate comment, I think, considering the times. And yet Golop is making this comment in the 1990s. What effect has he had? How much has changed in today's regime? Otto Dix shows us uh, the war cripples of World War I. Uh, they were everywhere in German cities, uh, and how few times we see them today. Uh, perhaps if we saw them more, uh, as we saw in the New York Times Magazine a couple weeks ago, uh, we would have more sympathy uh, for those war cripples and uh, perhaps a little bit more uh, reason to protest the current war. Contemporary works like this one by Hans Hock uh, also bear the weight of history. And perhaps you can appreciate this work, was, which was done about the Iraqi war, uh, as Americans are blinded by our patriotism. But understanding history adds another layer of interest to this, because Hawk was channeling John Hartfield, uh, the artist who in the 1930s did this image to show the same sort of blindness that occurs when the bourgeois Germans uh, were uh, neglecting to understand what Hitler was doing. My suggestion is that in the contemporary world, we have been, um, we've been blinded by the military industrial machine that Eisenhower warned us against. Uh, it is here. Uh, we can't separate the commercial from the military. And I also think that we become a culture of entertainment. 
even when James Rosenquist was doing this, F-111, as a protest against the Vietnam War, uh, there were some indications of that entertainment culture beginning. This is a, the beginning of the TV culture. Except during Vietnam, we only had, what, four or five stations to, to distract us? What happens when there are 300 to 500 cable stations to keep us busily entertained? It's so much easier to uh, reject or to ignore what's going on in society. Contemporary artists like Adrian Piper try to pull us in and uh, make us face issues of gender, issues of race and ethnicity, uh, inequality. But how many people who are not already connected to the art world are going to spend the time looking at an installation or a video and really engage with that? To understand some work like this by Dana Sturbach, you really need to have an understanding of history, uh, not just uh, simple political and social history, but also fashion history. I'm not sure that the general public has that. The same thing holds true for Yinka Shonabara's work. There are many, many layers here. It's a very brilliant um, play on uh, colonialism and, and post-colonialism. Uh, and yet, how many people have an understanding of the Dutch fabric trade to really understand what's going on in this image? I think that political art is probably more effective when it engages a larger public. And one way of doing that in the hands of Christoph Widischko is to literally go outside. His projections against buildings are huge, they're public. Sometimes he gets permission for these, sometimes he doesn't. But they're a much more accessible work of art and I think as a result much more powerful. And finally, another tool that can be used by contemporary artists to make a very effective political statement is to have the, the work engage the audience with it, to become a more participatory work. And I think that uh, the physical and emotional bonds that are created by someone like Felix Gonzalez Torres, uh, the slightly playful quality to his works uh, that are really about very serious concerns uh, are good examples then of works of art in the contemporary world that can make a difference because they move people quite deeply. I'd like to pass this on now to Larry. Take me just a minute here in our paperless society. I've got my remarks in my computer. Um, my name is Larry Levy. I've come from Delta College across the state uh, where I uh, am an English professor. And um, I think in not, I've not only come the farthest maybe to sit on this panel, but in, in some ways... Uh, I'm not a visual artist. I don't have a whole lot to put up on the screen for you. I have some words to share with you, though, uh, in fact, of three kinds. I want to, first of all, share some thoughts that occurred to me when Kim first proposed the idea of art as social change and that I sit on this panel and, and offer some thoughts uh, in regard to that. The second thing I want to share are some thoughts that occurred to me after touring Kim's installation this afternoon, which I highly recommend to you, and how they kind of tie in how what I have to say first ties into what happened when I uh, visited that installation this afternoon. And finally, I thought I might share a couple of poems with you uh, that I think illustrate a little bit of what, um, what I want to say. And how does this thing work? <laughs> uh, just go ahead. Yeah. Um, my first thoughts. Uh, some ten days ago or so when Kim first asked me about art and social change. This is what I wrote, more or less. I believe the arts make a difference first of all for the individual and it may be a response to the art as art rather than to any particular message of the art. I may perceive something beautiful and be moved by it. This is neither small nor trivial. To be aware that there is beauty in the world and that it may be created by inspired human beings. It raises my hopes for this world and for my experience that I may encounter such beauty again and may even be capable of creating something beautiful not only in my own eyes but also in the eyes of others. I think, too, an individual may be moved by the truth of the art, by the message. <laughs> I 
let's see if we can hold on to this screen here. <laughs> I may note something that is honest, not pretentious, not false in either its craft or its content. It may concern a harsh reality, but a reality nonetheless, uncompromised, not merely dogmatic, and am enlightened in heart and mind, or both. Some people are suspicious of art that has no obvious message or moral. They believe art's primary or sole function is to teach explicitly. In my view, they limit art's possibilities with so narrow a definition. Some people believe all art does is teach inherently, that any reference within a poem, novel, or drama is therefore an attempt to proselytize, to convert the audience to a particular way of thinking or acting. Uh, I didn't write this, but I'm thinking here on this part of the state. You go back several years when Harry Potter first came out, the response of the school district in this area, that any reference to witchcraft, to sorcery, must therefore be an attempt to convert people to sorcery or witchcraft, I think is a, hardly an idea that is limited to a school district on the western uh, part of this state. That's a, a, a very old idea, and one I think that is, is um, not my idea of art, much too limited. Um, as I say, I think this too is unfortunate and limiting. It's a kind of cookie cutter approach to all of art, whatever its mode or genre. Art is larger than that, so I am suspicious of prescriptions that art must be one thing or another. I've always liked Emily Dickinson's famous remark about poetry, that she knew it was poetry if it made the top of her head feel like it was coming off. I have had this experience in the presence of some poems, including some of Dickinson's, as well as some music, drama, fiction, film, sculpture, paintings, dance, architecture, and yes, installation art like Kim's, which I visited this afternoon. I've been moved, startled, arrested, compelled to look again to listen again, and I hope deepened, enriched. This seems to me art's most fundamental purpose. Does such a response lead to social change? I'm sure it can. And I'm sure some art is designed with social, social change in mind, as Sue just has spoken so well about. Some art is didactic in conception. It is meant to recruit to a cause, to move people to do something. In the eyes of the artist and the follower, this something is necessary and good. However, the art may be celebrating a bankrupt cause, may be recruiting onlookers to believe in hateful nonsense and to take action that is odious. The Nazis were masters at using what they called art for the most bestial of causes. It was effective in the short term. It's one reason I'm suspicious of art that overtly seeks to move groups to create a mass movement. The art I am most drawn to respects the individual who is thoughtful, reflective, who doesn't respond in a knee-jerk way with impulse. And that's basically what I first thought, but I thought, let's see what happens now when I go over to Grand Rapids and uh, spend, uh, oh, the hour or so that I went through Kim's installation. Um, I wrote this more or less, Kim, directly to you, even though I'm speaking to everybody. Kim. Each of the people you presented became compelling and real. They were no longer gay people, some abstraction or stereotype or cardboard cutout. Each became an individual, no less than I like to think I am, a person with a name. Each had a voice, a story, a life. And I think this is one of the major purposes of your project and of all of art. Look, listen, get closer. Life is richer than my narrow definitions, bigger than my neighborhood. Art admits far more variety than I might suppose in my limited and limiting way. The poet Richard Wilbur once wrote, love calls us to the things of this world. Isn't that a beautiful line? Love calls us to the things of this world. So I would add that art calls us to the things of this world, not to the abstractions, cliches, stereotypes, or cardboard cutouts, but to the rich particulars. In A Midsummer's Night Dream, a character says, the poet's eye doth glance from heaven to earth and earth to heaven and gives to airy nothingness a local habitation and a name. This is what art provides, what Kim has provided with her real people standing in front of me, projected onto me, speaking to me out of their humanity, about their humanity. 
If there is to be a broad social change or movement influenced by art, there must first be a movement in the individual human heart and mind. And having shared that, two poems that occurred to me, uh, probably neither poet all that well known. One I'm very sure is not well known. She's a student of mine. I found this kind of by accident, uh, just going through some papers. One is a poet named Jared Carter called The Purpose of Poetry, and I think it ties in with what I was saying. This old man grazed 30 head of cattle in a valley just north of the covered bridge on the Mississinawa, where the reservoir stands today, had a black border collie and a half-breed sheepdog with one eye. The dogs took the cows to pasture each morning and brought them home again at night and herded them into the barn. The old man would slip a wooden bar across both doors. One dog slept on the front porch, one on the back. He was waiting there one evening listening to the animals coming home when a man from the courthouse stopped to tell him how the new reservoir was going to flood all his property. They both knew he was too far up in years to farm anywhere else. He had a daughter who lived in Florida in a trailer park. He should sell now and go stay with her. The man helped bar the doors before he left. He had only known dirt under his fingernails and trips to town on Saturday morning since he was a boy. Always he had been around cattle and trees and land near the river. Evenings by the barn, he could hear the dogs talking to each other as they brought in the herd and the cows answering them. It was the clearest thing he knew. That night, he shot both dogs and then himself. The purpose of poetry is to tell us about life. And then maybe the other quotation that I have here, and how do I get that to go? <laughs> how do we make that happen? Uh, Seamus Heaney, line from one of Seamus Heaney's poems, which was there and gone. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this uh, again strikes me as a not just about a particular poet or poem but the idea of art itself I rhyme to see myself to set the darkness echoing here's a poem a student of mine wrote some years ago that I just found that does some of the same things I think it's called Moonlight Ride I remember going out the door of our house on Pine Drive into pitch blackness and finding our way tree by tree to the spot where we left the boat. Grabbing the side and heaving her 16 feet into the water, my dad, mom, sister, brother, and I jumped in. I remember the lake was magic, an onyx mirror broken only by ripples from plunging the boat into the stillness. Drifting out from under the trees lining the shore, the sky erupted, the Big Dipper, Orion, Jupiter, the North Star, Betelgeuse, the Milky Way, Dad knew them all. I remember dipping our oars in together and gliding swiftly through reeds that grabbed and squeaked the side of the boat. Clearing the rushes, we squealed with delight as Dad used only one oar spinning us in circles. I remember searching for treasure, lush green lily pads and delicate white flowers with yellow perfum perfumed feather middles. Making a slide to one side of the boat, reaching from the other, Dad gently pulled in our loot. I remember lily pad flowers, the only flowers Dad ever gave me. No, oh, Diane Brown. <laughs> A few thoughts about art. Thank you. So I get to follow the poet. <laughs> Somebody had. <laughs> it's me. Or I could have gone last. I, <laughs> um, I am who uh, the slide says I am. Um, it's truly me. <laughs> when Kim asked me to participate on this panel, um, and I thought about the question of art's impact on social change, I recognized that uh, I have always as an artist who does have an interest in affecting social change through my work, that I've always sort of vacillated back and forth between this place of cautious optimism and tremendous skeptic skepticism about my ability to have any impact whatsoever. Um, and as, as time passes, as I 
grow older, as I look at more art, work with more students, know more artists, frankly, I'm sorry to say my skepticism increases. And that may just be a reflection of uh, what I see happening in the world, in our society, and in our culture. I certainly don't perceive things to be getting any better. So when I consider this question of art's potential to affect social change, I, I find myself actually with far more questions than, than answers. Uh, some of those questions include uh, the question, do some art forms, for example, film and literature, have a greater potential impact than others? And I think they do. Um, and I wonder if this impact inequity is based on accessibility of the art form, or is this inequity inherent in the art form itself? I don't know. I wonder how we define social transformation, how we define the idea of effecting social change. Because certainly, as a visual artist, I myself have stood in front of many different pieces in my lifetime that have brought me to tears, brought me to a place of great joy, made me belly laugh out loud, and a whole range of other responses. So I, I don't question the idea that art can, visual art can affect us on a private, personal level. But when we talk about social transformation, we're talking about a much broader audience, a much larger impact. And that's where my questions uh, arise. Additionally, how do we even begin to measure the impact our work may have on social transformation? How do we know if our work is impacting anyone? Uh, it may be in a gallery. People come through and see it. They probably, in many instances, don't know who we are. And we never get to really talk to them and hear them say, wow, your work really had an impact on me. Your work really made me want to do something different, whatever that might be. So how do we measure this? I don't think we can. And as a teacher of art, I often wonder if my impact in the classroom has much greater potential to affect social change than the work I exhibit. The example I can set, who I am as an individual in engaging with my students and with other people in the world. Uh, independently of my role as an artist. Another thing that occurs to me as I think about this topic, although there are some exceptions, it seems to me that power and money, two things that are often in short supply for many artists, appear to offer the greatest opportunity for affecting social change, whether that be change for the better or for the worse. And when power and money come into play, politics is not far behind. And certainly the current political climate in the United States and in many other countries is particularly effective in silencing critical voices seeking authentic social transformation. There are, however, I think a, a few examples of contemporary and historical visual artists whose work serves to raise awareness about critical social and by association political issues and I wanted to just t touch on some of these artists and their work briefly. The first artist who comes to my mind is David Wojnarowicz, who died of AIDS in 1992. This piece is a photo text collage from 1990 in which he includes a 1950s snapshot of himself as a young boy surrounded by this very foreboding text that describes the probable outcome of the discovery of his homosexuality. Um, and as a, a lesbian artist, I certainly um, can relate very strongly to having um, grown up in the 50s and struggled with this issue myself. And this young, innocent boy finds that his desire is not controlled by himself, but by the family, the church, the school, medical community, law enforcement, government, and that he inevitably will be driven to conform, be silent, or suffer 
the disciplines of society. This is a piece uh, by the same artist taken from, um, I believe it was a film or a video entitled Silence Equals Death, which is an expression that's been around for a long, long time in relation to the AIDS epidemic and pandemic. It was Wojnarowicz's refusal to be silent that imbues his work with such power. His heavily documented life and the art he produced have become examples of one man's attempt to awaken social consciousness and transform the world's disdain into a powerful indictment against intolerance and apathy. And certainly that continues to be true in the face of what the AIDS pandemic is doing to the great nation of Africa today. This is a piece by Kara Walker, who, by the way, is featured in the October 2007 issue of Art in America. Walker's silhouette images are visual epics that reference folklore in the antebellum South, and they raise identity and gender issues for African American women in particular. There's a real cinematic feeling about um, a lot of Walker's work. She uses images from historical textbooks to show how white people depicted African American slaves through stock characters like mammies, pickaninnies, Uncle Toms, and sexually exaggerated young women. These works progress from white depictions of the American South prior to the Civil War to, in Walker's hands, an analysis of economic, social, and individual power structures that are still in place today. As Walker's work shows, racism and sexism are alive and well. Ida Applebrug is another artist I admire. Since the late 1970s, this New York painter has produced a body of work in which bland and bourgeois figures engage in these very obscure and often frightening activities. To quote Applebrug about her own work, she says, these are pictures about the politics of contemporary life, about loneliness, helplessness, dysfunction, power, aging, sexuality, the nuclear threat, the vulnerability of children. And the themes are woven together in tapestries that are fraught with irony. This is an age where people are dying without aging, certainly a reference to the AIDS epidemic, among other things. And others are aging without dying, which was a reference to her mother who lost her ability to function well before she died, and certainly speaks to the plight of the elderly and the devastation of Alzheimer's. William Kentridge, an artist I greatly admire, He's a white man from South Africa, highly educated in a family of um, lawyers who were very uh, socially engaged and felt, uh, felt that it was very important to put their education and their privilege to work toward the improvement of South Africa. Cambridge's work explores the legacy of apartheid and colonialism. Uh, through his use of very innovative use of charcoal drawings, prints, collages, stop animation, film, and theater. Kentridge was born in Johannesburg and considers that to be uh, where his work is rooted. And Kentridge says about his work, I have never tried to make illustrations of apartheid, but the drawings and films are certainly spawned by and feed off the brutalized society left in its wake. I am interested in a political art, that is to say, an art of ambiguity, contradiction, uncompleted gestures, and certain endings, an art and a politics in which optimism is kept in check and nihilism at bay. Lysansky. I've never quite known how to pronounce this artist's first name, but I always think of it as Mauricio. Bob? Suzanne? Great. All right. <laughs> the Nazi drawings, which are also uh, a book, a beautiful little book, um, 
is a series of pencil and wash drawings with collage that examine the brutality of Nazi Germany. And as we all know, the brutality of Nazi Germany is not no longer specific to Nazi Germany. All we have to do is turn on the evening news to um, see and hear about brutality taking place and genocide taking place in other countries while we sit on our butts and change the channels. Um, Lysansky saw a documentary that was put out by the U.S. military showing the victims in the aftermath of Nazi atrocities and had a tremendous impact on him. And so he devoted the next six years of his life to creating this series that consists of 30 individual pieces and, and one triptych. The figures are, or the drawings are quite large and in them the figures are uh, life size or larger than life. And ironically, these drawings are incredibly beautiful. They're, uh, for the most part, very, very delicate, um, done with really delicate materials, and yet they speak so effectively to the atrocities of what took place in Nazi Germany during World War II. Since their completion, the Nazi drawings have been exhibited in many prominent art museums around the world and have received a lot of public attention. In 1967, the Nazi drawings were one of the first exhibits that were installed at what was then the new Whitney, Mu Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City. Um, and the Nazi drawings continue to um, garner a lot of attention today, even though for the most part they are um, currently housed in um, a museum in Iowa and don't really uh, travel around as much as they once did. Barbara Kruger is an internationally renowned, renowned artist who is known for her uh, signature black, white, and red poster-style works of art that convey in-your-face messages about women's rights and issues of power. She um, attended Pratt Institute for a year, left that, and ended up in the magazine publishing in industry, specifically with Mademoiselle Magazine. So Kruger knows precisely how to capture the viewer's attention with her bold and witty photo murals displayed on billboards, bus stops, public transportation, as well as in major museums and galleries around the world. These large, bold works assimilate images taken from the deluge of mass media that is so predominant in contemporary society, which Suzanne made reference to earlier. Pictures and words derived from television, film, newspapers, and magazines comprise the media's powerful ability to communicate. So Kruger mirrors this fact when creating her own sexual, social, and political messages and effectively challenges the stereotypical ways the mass media influences our notions about gender roles, social relationships, and political issues. And the final artist or artists that I'd like to talk about are the Gorilla Girls. Yay, the Gorilla Girls. This is a group of women who in 1985 founded the group called the Gorilla Girls. They assumed the names of dead women artists and wore gorilla masks in public, and still do, to conceal their identities and focus on the issues rather than on their individual personalities. Between 1985 and 2000, close to 100 women working collectively and anonymously, produced posters, billboards, public actions, books, and other projects to make feminism funny and fashionable. At the turn of the millennium, the Guerrilla Girls split off into three separate and independent incorporated groups of Guerrilla Girls who continue to um, bring fake fur and feminism to new frontiers, as, as they so eloquently say. So when I look at these, this handful of artists and I relate it to the number of artists who actually are interested in social transformation, I fear that it is a very tiny fraction of us who are able to affect any sort of social change. And I'm sorry to report that in my opinion, we are in fact often preaching to the choir. I did want to note, however, as I watched people come in and sit down tonight, two artists that I see in the audience on opposite sides of the aisle whose work 
I'm very aware of one artist who is uh, very vocal in his criticism of um, our current um, administration and the wars in which we are engaged. And another young artist who is very, very interested in terms of social transformation with bringing joy and happiness to others through her work. Very different sides of the aisle. But regarding work that affects me personally, I want both of those artists to know, and I suspect you know who I'm talking about, that your work does indeed impact me in the ways that you want it to. Thank you. Okay, so um, excuse my reading. I'm probably going to just have to, for, for the sake of like uh, urgency and um, articulation. Um, and I want to just start by saying thank you. It's a really a pleasure to be involved in this discussion on the transformative possibility of art. I'm going to focus my remarks tonight on ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, self-described as an, a diverse nonpartisan group united in anger and committed to direct action to end the AIDS crisis. And the argument that I want to make tonight, and the argument that has been made by others, including Douglas Crimp, uh, who's an art critic and theorist, former ACT UP organizer, co-author of the book AIDS Demographics, which is uh, an anthology of artwork and actions produced by the first three years, during the first three years of ACT UP. Um, so this argument that I want to make is that the effectiveness of the organization was in large part a result of its visual presence. Um, ACT UP was driven by writers, designers, visual artists, performance artists, photographers, and filmmakers and they produced a wide range of innovative actions, public spectacles, marches, guerrilla theater, die-in, posters, t-shirts, stickers, and video work that together formed a uniquely strategic, media-savvy collection of tools for protests and also safe sex education. And I'll cut off to the next one. Yeah, got it. Um, and all of these, they have the previous one said Grand Fury, and this one says Donald Moffat. So these are either members or uh, affiliated groups of ACT UP. Um, at the time of the organization's founding in March 1987, there was a lack of information on how to prevent infection, a lack of funding for AIDS research, double-blind placebo tests were being conducted on AIDS patients, and the FDA drug approval process was terminally slow. When one drug, AZT, managed to be relatively quickly approved, two years instead of ten, um, suspiciously a drug monopoly was created for its patent holder, and treatment was unsurprisingly extremely expensive, and insurance companies um, refused to pay for what they determined to be experimental treatments, basically all treatments at that time. Um, There's also minimal coverage or outright misinformation from the media, among them the New York Times. And the primary solution to the AIDS crisis offered by politicians was mandatory testing, and to quote Jesse Helms, the logical outcome of testing is to quarantine those infected. So this is sort of the, the scenario, the, the atmosphere in which um, in the context of this systematic corruption and discrimination, ACT UP launches the effort of creating awareness and education, and soon after its formation is credited with successfully pressuring the FDA to speed up its drug approval process. And there's a couple images of different sorts of actions. Um, after several years of pressure from Congress and the National Academy of Sciences, in the seventh year of his presidency, Reagan announced the formation of his presidential commission on the HIV uh, epidemic. Um, only one person appointed to the 15-member commission had professional qualifications. The others held a range of troubling positions. Some did not believe in the possibility of safe sex and thought HIV could be acquired through casual contact. Uh, several were in favor of mandatory HIV testing and quarantine. Among the members of the commission was our own Richard DeVos, who at the time of his appointment was, to quote Crimp, President of the Amway Corporation, co-chairman of the Republican National Committee, and board member of the Robert Schuller Ministries, a televangelist corporation. With no professed knowledge of AIDS, DeVos was chosen, according to administration spokesperson, because, quote, we wanted to make sure we had folks on the commission with a sense for the average American. Um, part of the problem here, as you're already identifying, of course, is that, um, 
you know, due to government inaction, not only was the average American dangerously ill-informed about AIDS, but, you know, whether Richard DeVos um, has an accurate sense of the average American at any level is clearly, at, at the very least, debatable. So I'll get back to this image. Um, so ACT UP responded by staging protests outside the Commission's meetings, including this image on the bottom left. Um, and their activism was likely a factor in the resignation of both the chair and vice chair of the commission. ACT UP continued to apply pressure to the commission following it across the country, including Crimp again, uh, testifying at its hearings when possible and meeting with individual members as they grew more sympathetic. When the commission's final report was issued on June 27th in 1988, its recommendations were so reasonable that President Reagan and later President Bush decided to ignore them. Um, I don't know what role DeVos played in the drafting of those recommendations, but it's notable that throughout the dem uh, that through demonstrating its ability to generate media coverage, ACT UP had established itself as a political voice to be respected. And I want to finish by considering our expectations for the power of art. So we can talk about um, Picasso exhibit Guernica, and he's kind of shopping it around to different galleries in Europe, uh, exposing the brutality of the Spanish Civil War and at the time, I'm sure it was no doubt effective, and it continues today to speak to that history. Um, but that mode of practice is dependent on a utopian, manifesto, saturated, modernist conception of artist as genius and art as inspired and inspiring object of reference, uh, reverence. So uh, if our expectations for art are as ambitious as political change, then in this postmodern society, embedding art uh, or an artistic sensibility into contemporary modes of communication, along with mobilizing communities and individuals, working to communicate to a large audience, and putting direct pressure on key figures are all strate uh, critical strategies to adapt. And ACTUP's influence was largely a result of this kind of hybridist strat uh, hybridized strategy. The public spectacles, the sophisticated graphics, the videos, the skill in using news media to spread their message. And the degree to which ACT UP is no longer as active as it was 20 years ago now um, is both a reflection of the number of people in the organization lost to AIDS uh, and also the degree to which ACT UP's work has made AIDS a manageable illness for insured Americans and therefore a seemingly less urgent epidemic. Thanks. Um, is that, can you hear me okay? Uh, my name is Tom Block. And there's a lot of fodder here. How about now? Um, there's a lot of fodder here for conversation, but I'll leave it alone until we can, you know, get into it among ourselves instead of just taking the first pot shots. Um, I have, through my own work, developed a very specific theory of how art can affect social change, and I have tried to continue to imp implement this in a, in a variety of manners. And there's a few very basic things that I've learned, and I'll go through some of my own work in a minute. I just want to talk about the ideas. But the first is that I, I think if you want to, as an artist, affect social change, you have to view your art as a means and not an end. And that once you view your artwork as an inviolable piece, an inviolable object, then it will lose uh, transformative social power because you are saying that this is the end. This is why I created this. It has to be exactly like this. And quite frankly, when you put art into an art gallery, um, you've taken it out of the realm of any kind of hope for affecting social change because you have to approach people where they actually are learning, uh, they're formulating the reality. And in our, in our society, I think we formulate our reality from what we see in advertisements, um, what we see in the media, and what politicians say. And so I think that, uh, for me, I have tried to use the art to infiltrate these realms. And once you infiltrate those realms, perhaps the art's not necessarily high art in the sense that you, know, you won't get the kind of price you would get if you were in a Chelsea gallery. But you will reach people in such a way that they no longer view it just as entertainment. And it might, at least, be taken in a way that will affect them. Um, I also think it's very important when you're creating uh, an activist art that you 
work towards some positive social change. So even though the initial impetus for creating the work might be anger, I mean, as it often is, a disgust or what a horror or whatever you're feeling about things that are going on, the work itself needs to be thought of as an, as an infiltration. And that once you start trying to beat people over the head with your work, all you're doing is setting up a binary us and them dynamic. And the people that agree with you will agree with you and feel cathartically released. And the people that disagree with you will disagree with you and that'll be the end of that. So you really have to, or I have thought in terms of more of an infiltration in terms of my work. And uh, lastly, in a very general sense, I think that you have to view, I keep saying you, I'm saying I do view activist artwork um, as much more than just raising awareness. I do not think raising awareness of issues is enough. It's something, it's a start. But activism, activists, literally means to activate. And you want to activate an audience to do something. And so raising awareness is not enough, and it's very hard to activate energies in this hysterical society we live in, you know, overblown, technologically uh, bombarded as we are. But activism, when I think of activist art, I think of it as coalescing energies around an idea and then having this energy move out of the art world and into the realm of actually making a difference. Now let me just briefly introduce my theory, which I've called perfect, prophetic activist art. And it actually brings together a lot of um, various aspects of history. It, it takes medieval conceptions of prophecy. Uh, in medieval times, prophets from all three Abrahamic faiths, like Moses Maimonides or Muyuddin Ibn Arabi and uh, St. Francis of Assisi, all felt that prophecy was more than just pointing out what was wrong in the world to actually taking a specific positive legislative role. And all three of those, and many, many prophets in all three religions, would do more than just say the sky is falling. Uh, for instance, St. Francis of Assisi went on, during the Crusades, went on a peace mission to visit with the sultan in, um, I'm not sure if I remember, Darum Sada, I think it was in Egypt. But he took an activist role. Uh, Moses Maimonides would interpret law in an activist way that was not necessarily strictly adhering to the law, but he was adhering to a prophetic sense of trying to ease relations between Muslims and Jews or make the world a better place. So that's an important idea of prophecy. And then I brought it together with uh, what I call the postmodern cult of the individual. And we live at a time when individuals are empowered and respected in a way they never have been before. And I think this can have very negative, uh, a lot of very negative aspects, like it's my God-given right to drive an SUV through the loon mating grounds in northern Minnesota. That's negative. But it's positive in the sense that we have a conception of human rights, uh, one person, one vote democracy, and the fact that an individual can actually have a voice to make a difference that I think is unparalleled in the history of humankind. And then I also um, bring in a sense of post-religious spirituality. I think, um, and if you see Kim's, uh, have the chance to see Kim's installation, I mean, I was struck by how the, a lot of the negative energy stemmed from organized religions in these issues. And that I think there is a yearning for uh, spirituality and a connection outside of these religious structures that feel oppressive. And that one way is to, to act, and that through action you can actually um, evince a spirituality. And then lastly is to reinvigorate the historical purpose of art making, which until quite recently, I think, had everything to do with raising the human gaze to uh, humanity's highest possibility. And I think that's changed in the past 100 years but through a sort of prophetic activist art vision, you, you uh, an artist can do that through action instead of just painting a religious picture. Now let me show you how I've done, um, tried to do this with my own art. I'm just going to show a couple projects. I have about four or five projects, and once I start them, I consider them ongoing. And I try to show them and wrap in other uh, vectors. One of the most important aspects of this is with using art as a means instead of an end is that I look for what I call an injection vectors. And this, the way Kim has gathered this panel and the next panel on the 25th are perfect examples of that, where you reach outside of the art gallery and into the greater society using a lot of different manners. Now, um, let's see if I can, there. The first project I'm gonna talk about is uh, a human rights painting project. And this is really where a lot of my theory comes from. I worked in conjunction with Amnesty International 
and in fact I've devoted up to 50 percent of sales to that group, which has done two things. One, it has allowed me to specifically affect change by donating money to this organization, but for those of us up here will understand it's also increased sales pressure and people are more likely to buy it because they're buying into an event instead of just a painting. Uh, that's a process piece for paintings of the Dalai Lama. That is a large six-foot painting of an Afghan woman shedding her burqa. And all the painting images come from Amnesty, Amnesty International, prisoners of conscience, and, and freedom fighters. And what it does is it tries to break down a sense of us and them, where the us is all these people in different ethnic and religious and geographic categories working for the common good, and they're working against this sort of authoritarian energy that is present in all, in, in all parts of the world. Now here is an um, image of the first show. You see th uh, the paintings themselves are quite large. And then there is a biography next to each painting, so a person will get a very specific idea of what those persons are doing. Now here is a good example of what I try to do. There is a picture of myself with um, Bill, S Bill Schultz, uh, Executive Director of Amnesty International, John Sweeney, who is the president of the AFL-CIO, and then um, Suari Omoyele on the right, and that's actually a painting of him right behind him, and that he was a Nigerian human rights activist. Now, at the opening of the show at the AFL-CIO, President Sweeney and Bill Schultz met for the first time, and they actually disappeared into the offices prior to this, and they, in talking, decided that these two organizations would work together. And in fact, since that time, there has been a number of initiatives jointly undertaken between Amnesty and AFL-CIO. And, and that was, I learned a lot from that, because this is something art can do. It can bring people together. It brought these two organizations together and then increased that energy. And now they do, they continue to have an ongoing relationship. And not, I'm not taking credit, but I mean, I think one thing art can do is provide this spark, because it operates outside of the political system. I also think art could provide a spark between enemies, a place, a non-political place to meet um, across conflict. And I think that's a, an area I want to explore. Uh, this is also another way that I try to raise the profile of an art uh, exhibit. And this is, these are a series of honorary co-sponsors, uh, Dalai Lama, John Kerry, Paul Wellstone was on there. And in doing this, you're signaling to the audience that this is more than just an art show. This is important. You use, you're accepting the way people are ordering their reality and infiltrating it. So if they see a show with these names attached to it, it becomes more than just an art show to an audience and therefore has more social relevance to them. I mean, I think one, one thing as an activist artist, you just have to accept certain things and infiltrate them instead of just saying, I think it's stupid the way people order reality. You know, Screw them. I'm going to put this up in a gallery and if they don't see it, you know, they get what they deserve, these humans. Um, here's another public art project. I created a bunch of small, these are about 10 by 7 inches, and they're quotes from a variety of wisdom masters across all different religions and time periods and ethnicities. And then what I've done, and I am here they are in a bus stop, I put them up in the public spaces, and here it's sort of co-opting advertising space, and I have a whole a workshop I teach on, on sort of co-opting bathroom space where you create these little images and, and gorilla just put them up in bathrooms. Because I think people are no more vulnerable when they're just you know, sitting in a public space, relaxing for a minute. They're not doing anything else. So you know, catch them at a vulnerable moment. But here it is in a um, public space. And this is actually an ongoing project. I'm about to uh, install a large series of them in Silver Spring, Maryland in a public space. And that by sh somebody walking along and seeing a bunch of sayings from Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, 2,000 years ago, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., and seeing the way they po all positively interrelate, again, hopefully you're breaking down these conceptions of us and them and, and giving them a sense that us does not have to do with the color of the skin or the particular religious affiliation. It's a way of looking at the world. So um, that's, that's the images I have. Like I said, there are some other, some other uh, projects. But in general, I, I, do, I really do think art can make a difference, but I think you have to think very specifically as an artist about how you can affect change and what you really want and, and what the power of art is. And I think the power of art is subtle, and I think it is unitive. I don't think you're going to, you know, I don't think art and revolution be, should be used in the same sentence. I think art and infiltration, art and healing, art and 
you know, working across conflicts. I think that there really is um, a lot that can be done with art, and I hope to continue proving it. Thank you. I wonder if any panelists would like to address other panelists before we open it up to the audience. This is towards Tom. What do you say to, and I'm sure you've gotten this response from various artists, both fine arts and graphic artists. What do you response to, are you selling out? Thank you for the question. Um, when I, I have developed theory and I continue to write and I present about these ideas, I say it's primary that an artist first work on their own vision and their own conception of beauty. Now, once you've created that art, it is in what you do with that art that I think my theory really takes over, the idea of how you use it, how you seed it in. I, I say it, I'm obviously within the art world. I don't operate within the art world. I'm, I'm usually speaking at peace, justice, human rights conferences. I'm working in nonprofit spaces or with groups like Amnesty International because within the art world, there is a circle the wagon kind of sense where, and I, I mean, we can, that's a whole other conversation, but... I would say do not sell out your art because you will make more powerful statement by being true to yourself. But once you have created this work of art, and I had a little talk with Kim about her work, um, once you've created it, then think creative, creatively about how you can insinuate that into the greater society. And if, if making your beautiful personal art um, more relevant to the greater society is selling out, then I'm selling out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. But don't, do not sell out your personal vision, artistic vision. I'm not suggesting that. Um, Deb, I had a question for you about, you were talking about pedagogy as, I'm probably not very good at using this, you are talking about pedagogy as possibly one of the more effective ways that you have influence um, as, as your work. Um, what's your sense of, um, in terms of like the, the students that you're working with, um, is there a sense from them that there's a, an interest in political work or transformative work, or is that something that you feel like um, you're injecting in, as part of your teaching? Well, certain, certain classes that I um, have the privilege of teaching specifically engage students with social, cultural, political issues. And some of them are kicking and screaming all the way at the beginning, and others are, you know, excited to dive in. And what I often observe is that um, even though this is a, sort of an intermediate level uh, course in drawing, is that a lot of students get really turned on to working with those ideas in their work, and that I find evidence of that in their thesis work um, as they're graduating from, from school. Um, some of my students are naturally, you know, more inclined to want to be doing um, work that uh, has the potential to affect social change, and other students don't have that interest at all, and I don't push it on anyone. But I actually was also speaking about, you know, not only the kinds of things we talk about in relation to, um, to art making, image making, and um, the sort of Bad baggage and rhetoric of a lot of contemporary theory, but just in terms of how we interact as as teachers with students, um, <laughs> with compassion, with uh, sensitivity, um, if I may say, you know, with love. Um, it sounds so corny and cheesy, but just. I think as, as teachers, we really set an example in terms of how we in, engage with the world. And, and our student, we engage with our students, and our students also see us in, engaging with other people. And 
So we, we, we wear a lot of hats, I think, in pedagogy, but I think just how we live our lives and the degree to which we are willing to share that with our students can have a real am impact independently of their, of their art, <coughs> art making, because there's a lot of ways to affect social change, not just through making art. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Jump in on that question. Also, um, the sheer numbers of students that we come in contact with uh, is also important. So, for example, I have 95 students this semester alone, and if I've been teaching for almost 30 years, multiply wow. 95 times two times two 30. Times 30 <laughs> uh, I've come into probably a lot of into contact with so many students more than perhaps would go into a gallery to see an artwork. Uh, so. Yeah, I agree, teaching is, is very important. And it's that public nature that, Tom, you were talking about, too. Um, the art, art that serves only galleries, uh, I think, is more selling out to art as commodity than the type of art that you do, which is more public, or somebody like uh, Wadishko also. Large audiences are important. Just by the way, that's 5,700 students. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my! <laughs> I want to I want to comment a little bit on this theme too. Uh, I took some notes and been listening to some of my fellow panelists. Uh, uh, Susan, you said something early about uh, enjoying political art, but I'm skeptical about how much it can change the world. Um, and um, Anna, I think you talked about the transformative possibility, not certainty, but possibility. And uh, and I think uh, let's see, Tom. It might have even been you. Hopefully, you're breaking down conceptions. I mean, there's no certainty in that. And I got to thinking, when is it a certainty? It's a certainty when it's Joseph Goebbels creating that kind of art. You know exactly what you're doing, and you know exactly the kind of effect it's going to have. And you are going to change mm -hmm. masses of people toward a particular goal. That's you know, that's social change of a kind, uh, not particularly a useful one, ultimately. Not the kind that I think Tom is talking about, where you're not interested in human dignity, but uh, human misery. Um, but that's, that's where you have the certainty. I think other than that, what you have is, if you're creating some kind of art, you have possibly, potential, hopefully, you might affect somebody, something like that might happen. And I think if I absolutely am interested in persuading people, I probably wouldn't write a poem at all. Uh, I don't think when I'm sitting down to write a poem, I am thinking, okay, I'm gonna change people's minds with this poem. I would write a letter to some journal where I know lots and lots of people are gonna see it. I'd write a sermon. I'd get a pulpit. Uh, I would um, get pamphlets going. I'd try and see myself more like Tom Paine as my idol as my mentor, or Mahatma Gandhi, or Martin Luther King, I'd write speeches, but I don't know that I would necessarily say to myself, I'm writing a poem right now. On the other hand, why did those things have the power they did? They did borrow many of the techniques of poetry. They, weren't, they, they were crafted, and there's a reason why, I think, besides the power of his conscience that Martin Luther King was heeded, the man could write and he could speak. There were lots of people, I think, who thought uh, very similar stuff, but he was setting out, you know, w with a certain goal in mind, very much to change people's hearts and minds. And certainly in teaching, you know, I think we're all teachers here. And, um, you know, I think maybe I'm the oldest on this panel, so, if, you know, you got 5,000, I'll see your 5,000 and raise it another 5,000. <laughs> and, um, and there's lots of ways, I think, in which you affect people. But even then, I, w I want to caution, because I've known teachers like this too that when Ralph Nader was little and would come home from school, his father would say to him, well, Ralphie, did they teach you to think or to believe? I think, though I have beliefs, when I'm in the classroom, my goal is to draw those people out and to draw them into thought and to help them think critically and not merely to puppet me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I'm very careful about that. Um, my personal views are not really a part of my teaching. Yeah, they, may, they may become that if I get to know the student very well outside of class, after class, after the semester's over when we're talking about something else. But I don't see that as my purpose at all as a teacher. I think that would be, in fact, rather dishonest and unethical. And I think there are teachers who do that. They're, they're proselytizing to a rather 
um, easily intimidated group of people. And, um, and I, I don't think that's fair at all. In a way, though your motives may be pure, what are you doing that's, um, in, in a way, but what Goebbels did? You're teaching them to believe, not to think. So some thoughts on that. We have a question? Well, I don't know. Um, I, have to, I have to admit that I have not seen Kim's show yet, so I'm not depressed as the panel seems to be <laughs> at the moment. Um, but um, a couple of comments I'd like to address, and actually uh, the two gentlemen have kind of addressed these comments, because I do believe, I do believe that art can affect enormous changes. One example that Dr. Eberle showed was the the slave ship, which within a couple of months after being shown, Parliament changed the laws and outlawed, outlawed the buying and selling of slaves in England. So a painting can change history. Now, true, that was 200 years ago, but I do believe these kinds of things can still happen. Did James Mallard William Turner intend that to happen? I don't think so. I think he was just expressing his outrage, and then something happened. And so to address something that, that Deb Rockman was saying is, we don't know what effect our art is having. But, but to me, that, that's part of the excitement of being an artist or being a teacher or being a poet, is we don't know. But we know something's happening out there, and we have to hope it's happening for the good. I wrote some notes, if I can read them here, um, that the very nature of social transformation is that society is, comp is comprised of many individuals, and therefore change, the best of all changes, takes place person to person. It doesn't take place by presidential mandate or by an invasion. It takes place person to person, it seems to me. And so I'm of the belief that, that with that in mind, I mean, that's what, that inspires, well, that's what inspires me to make my art, to write my words, to go into my class word, classroom, is that something is going to start a ripple effect. That may be very naive and childish, but I would like to know what the panel thinks of, thinks of that notion. Also, <laughs> how do artists compete with Britney Spears? I mean, you know, the problem is we have a, a media out there which uh, turns everything, everything uh, into, into um, an important event, even when it's not an important event. Um, anyway, so I think I had several other thoughts here, but I don't want to take up all the time. So. <laughs> deal with those two. <laughs> I don't disagree at all with your comment about one by one by one. I think, I, I don't want to put words in Tom's mouth, but I think even that's how his art would affect people, one by one by one. I don't think masses necessarily change. Masses are one by one by one. And as for Britney Spears, uh, you make me think of something Neil Postman says in uh, his essays um, about the um, thermostatic view of education that it should be that the dominant curriculum in our society is the media. And I think that's as probably a, a good example of it as any, that what, what has happened to Britney Spears is the media has made her huge. She's a part of the dominant curriculum. His argument is that um, he doesn't say art, but school should operate like a thermostat. If uh, the media, um, say television, is program after program utterly isolated, then maybe we need more learning communities in school where knowledge is integrated. If um, people are essentially passive in the face of the media. You can listen or not listen to your radio or your iPod or your television. You know, you can get up and leave. You can go to sleep. It doesn't really matter. Then school should do the opposite of that and not let students sleep in the back row of the seminar hall. There should be constantly engaging with students and, and not letting them be silent, anonymous, invisible, or any of the things that students are tending to do. And, and I think what you're suggesting maybe is, or I don't know if you're suggesting it, but uh, I would say maybe art needs to do the opposite too, that um, there needs to be some kind of an engagement, but how you make that happen, I'm not sure. You could have people, even in those bus stops where Tom has so courageously put his art, just not looking at it, not seeing it, in the same way that they don't sometimes see whatever's in the bus stop or in the, in the lavatory. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no guarantee. It's a bold move. You know, they have poems on buses in some of the big cities, too, but that doesn't mean people read them. Or if they read them and are momentarily moved, that the move is something they take to heart, and it really does make a, make a change. One of the things I first thought of when Kim proposed this was a, a famous line in um, W.H. Auden's 
a memoriam to Yeats when Yeats died that poetry makes nothing happen, he says. Um, ironically, later in that poem, he says quite a bit about the power of poetry. <laughs> but at one point, he says, poetry makes nothing happen. And, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, hard to say when it has. One, one form of poetry that I thought a lot about making something happen I'm a child of the last century in some ways. I grew up in the 60s, and the music of the 40s, 50s, and 60s that I think had a lot to do with social change was folk music and Woody Guthrie's music and uh, the influence Guthrie had on many, many folk artists and the kinds of songs they were writing. And, and, and uh, you know, Tom, what was your phrase about infiltration and so on? Those were songs that were sung on street corners and coffee houses and streets and libraries and so on, and people listened to them, and it did get people marching. But not all of the music was like that, you know. Some of it was children's silly songs that Woody Guthrie wrote, you know. Isn't Auden saying just the opposite? By saying poetry makes nothing happen, he's making something happen. Right? No? Mm -hmm. You don't think so? Um, well, here I am quoting him. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> In the prison of our days, teach the free man how to praise. That's another line in that poem um, about human dignity. So I have a question. Um, uh, you all have touched on mass media and the effect it has on culture today. So I'm just wondering, um, in terms of the power of art, do you see that perhaps new media and new technologies um, have more reach to change than perhaps old school techniques as drawing, printmaking, um, painting, sculpture, things like that. Do you, does anyone want to speak about how technology today in the art world may have a broader reach on the power to change social consciousness? I think there's actually sort of two two parts in that question. I mean, one is the role that technology plays in the accessibility of images, or uh, I shouldn't just limit it to imagery, that the internet is connecting us in ways we might never have imagined. Um, but on another level, um, the experience of seeing visual art on the internet is radically different than seeing it in person. And personally, um, I feel like even as an artist who has remained open over the years to the shifts that have taken place in the art world, and just in the world in general, I mean, when I was in graduate school looking for a teaching position, my resume was done on an IBM Selectric typewriter. Computers weren't anywhere around, and if I was going to stay viable, I had to, you know, learn technology and, and run to keep up. Um, but I, I personally, when I look, when I go into a, a, a gallery or look through the art mags and see these pictures of installations and videos and I, I'm, personally, I don't respond to them in the same way that I do to something that isn't so engaged with um, technology and, and new genre. I think a lot of young artists are hopping on the train and new genre is hot stuff right now and there's certainly a place for it, but I haven't found um, my place with it in terms of it having the same kind of impact on me that a um, older form of, of image making might have. The same could be said with poetry, for example. I would much rather sit and hold a book in my hand and read from that than sit in front of a computer monitor and read from that. I think that the mass media has also speeded up our sense of time and our tolerance of uh, all art. Um, sometimes when I take students to museums, I find that they balk at uh, going into, let's say, a, a room that has a video or an installation in there, um, partly because they have to make a time commitment of five minutes, ten minutes, half an hour, 
and they're used to very speeded up senses of time. Uh, they want things in quick little bites. Um, remember, they multitask, you know, on computer screens. And I, I'm usually at the door telling them, no, 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 go back in there. You know, stay for another 10 minutes. You need to see the whole thing. <laughs> and they're just antsy. You know, they want to get out. And I think that, that some of those students who act that way are uh, responding to uh, technology. To understand any kind of message that art has, you have to dwell on the art. You have to sit with it. You have to commit to it and engage with it. And it requires a certain amount of thoughtfulness and, uh, again, a, a personal time that's spent with it. So we have to uh, hope that, that uh, people will, will commit that kind of time and that personal energy to the art. Hey, um, may I just completely disagree for one second before we move on to our next question? Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. um, I think w one of the things I've discovered, to go back to what you asked, is that you know, you, we're operating within a society as it is. You know, I wish people were sitting down with books. I wish they'd stare at my paintings, but they're not. So, and I, I talked to Kim about this earlier because she's got these wonderful videos. I said, what about cutting them up into one minute or two minute segments and having them run between shows on, on local um, public television? Or, you know, this incredible second life is this incredible virtual reality. I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but it's you know, millions of people will play life on the computer. So see some activist art in there somehow. I mean, I think you have to acknowledge and if you can utilize or help other people utilize. I mean, these are facts. You know, again, we can turn our back to these facts, but these are facts. This is the way our society now operates. And that if you want to affect change, you have to go into those worlds or be willing to access them somehow. And that means looking at your art. So if you have an obligation, it's very different than saying, you know, I've done this art, and if you don't get it on my terms, then screw you. Pardon my French. But I think the two very different ways of looking at art. And in my opinion, that's often the way it breaks down. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, I would say, you know, but even what you're saying is a theory. Um, there's no guarantee that what you're saying is in fact affecting change. I mean, I, I spent a good hour today, Kim, in your installation. And truth be told, you know, I'm not a teenager. I'm decades removed from that. But wearing that, that whatever that was that you had me put on when I went in, it gets warm after yeah. about 15 minutes. Yeah. It's not comfortable. <laughs> And, you know, my knees and ankles aren't what they used to be. So I'm standing here, and I'm, I'm not kidding. When I got to the third segment, I reached over to the stool and tried to sit down on it, you know, and it didn't move. And I thought, okay, there's nothing here by accident. I am meant to sweat, to be uncomfortable, and to stand here. And, uh, and then I thought, of course, I could leave at any time. But I thought, well, I'm not going to do that. First of all, Kim's my friend. She's put a lot of work into this, and I, and I, and I was moved by the first couple segments, and I thought if I leave, there's something I'm missing from the total picture here. There's some part of, the, of her perception that I'm not going to get if I cut any of these out. But I did have to make that commitment, and that does fly in the face of, uh, of, a, of a certain kind of impulsive response mm -hmm. to things that I think popular media wants. I mean, really, when, when music videos first started becoming popular, I remember being stunned by them because I thought, Gosh, I'm, I'm going to have a seizure watching this this flashing of, vi of, of uh, images here, and I thought, what what is the implication here that you are not meant to look at anything long? And I thought, and yet, all of the art that has mattered to me is stuff that I've been looked at, I've looked at long, poems that I could reread, I could pause over a line, or if it was a movie, I could watch it several times, a song I could listen to, something hanging in a gallery or somewhere else out in the world where I could sit and look at it or stand and look at it. Um, so, you know, there may be lots of people not interested in that. As I say, um, there's potential. But the other thing somebody on this panel has had talked about, too, was the preaching to the choir. You know, I'm already in agreement with you. I am already sympathetic to all those people that you have interviewed. And, um, and I'm wondering, how do you get somebody who's a bigot? Mm -hmm. <coughs> You know, that's what you're really after is how do you change the heart of somebody who is filled with hate if they were to come to something like this, which is highly unlikely, but if they were to come and give, you know, even some portion of their time wearing that heavy, sweaty thing and standing there, not sitting, uh, and watch this stuff, how long would they be willing to put up with it? Um, and then, of course, the other thing is 
you know, when, when my wife and I were there, we were the only ones there. Downtown Grand Rapids, uh, they, you know, I, I come here every so often. It's getting better, but it's still a relatively quiet, untrafficked place, even in the middle of a work week. So there's not the flood of customers there seeing this. Maybe do you need to do what Tom is suggesting and find some other way to take that installation, which is, I think, powerful. But, you know, if you, if you make a powerful work of art and only a few people see it, does it make any change? Uh, I won't forget about it. So I thought, okay, how can I get that installation over to Delta College? You know, that's a start. But who will come see it at Delta College? People who are already disposed. You know, I know I'm well aware that plenty of my students will not go see it. And if, even if I assign them to go see it, which is not really in the spirit of what we're about, <laughs> um, what then? You know, you know, I mean, I, I would, I would, uh, they'd respond to it all right, but, I, you know, I would get, uh, as I got years ago when uh, Stokely Garmichael came to speak at Delta College, and I said, let's go. So I took my whole class over there, and afterwards, you know, we talked about it, and they wrote about it and so on. And then at the end of the semester, somebody wrote on my student eva on the evaluation of the course, uh, Levy's a nigger lover. And I thought, that's the upshot of my, having, uh, of my taking you to, to see this man of conscience, this brilliant speaker who uh, irked me no end, particularly when he would get into his anti-Semitic rants, uh, but I found him very much worth hearing. But that was the impact it had on the, on the student. So I, you know, I, I'm just wondering, uh, when the infiltration that Tom talks about, where is that? I, I, I think you just constantly try, you make available, you, you find different venues. And then um, I quoted Shakespeare earlier, the readiness is all, as Hamlet says, in a very different context. But if a person's heart is not ready, I just don't know what's going to happen, even in the face of powerful communication. Um, Hi, this is for all the panelists and for Kim as well. Um, you kind of just touched on that, but how do you, do you have any, any advice for artists working in a community like West Michigan where it's hard to get people to even look at your work, let alone get them to change? Do you personally have any advice for artists working for social or political change? If you mean by that an ultra-conservative part of the world, the eastern part of Michigan isn't much different. Uh, and you know what? One of the best poetry readings I ever had was in West Branch in a coffee shop. Somebody invited me to go up there. It was a huge turnout, and all these people came, and they and they really were listening. <laughs> even the even the person who uh, you know ran the coffee shop stopped the hissing espresso machine while I was reading, and I thought there are people everywhere who are willing to listen. So you know, just as there are people everywhere who aren't going to come. So whatever it is you've got, I thought what Tom said earlier, be true to your vision. And, and then if you have a way to make it public, do that. And if one person comes, it's obviously you'd like more than that. But if one person comes, that's one more person than you had when it was just sitting in your, in your bedroom or in your, in your apartment, <laughs> and that's a start. And don't be dismayed by that. I'll toss a couple things in. Um, I think that um, maybe a few things, like just on the on the idea of new media, is that more or less helpful? Um, I think that it is a useful strategy, and I think that we can see in Kim's work, for example, that there's something in that installation that adds this really visceral quality to the content that you're receiving, and it's doing that because it's implicating the viewer and involving the viewer in this really uh, physical particular way, and then that's pretty critical, um, that it's not the sort of distanced object. Um, and so I think that's a useful strategy for sure. Um, I also, um, mm, I think that there's a sort of hesitancy that people have um, making assumptions about the community that they're in. Um, and I've heard far more often since I've moved here that this is a highly, highly conservative community. And I'm, I'm not, you know, ignorant to the roots of that conservatism here, certainly. But, um, but the fact that there's a lot of folks that feel like misfits makes a big difference. And so the community that can be found here 
is really, um, in some ways, there's a greater sense of urgency felt here that I think folks can truly take advantage of. And I'll just toss another thing out there, which is that um, I'm hearing some frustration about, um, you know, there's no patience to look at work or take it in long enough. And I think that what there's been is this just sort of shift between or from um, a more kind of contemplative appreciation for work or taking in of work to this desire to have a more kind of um, maybe conversational, dialogical um, relationship to work. So something where you're physically involving yourself in an installation makes more sense than just staring at a television screen. And um, even if that means that you're dealing with like quick cuts or lots of like fast different things or people are um, watching three YouTube videos at once or whatever it is like that's there's something in that that is useful to think about as a strategy so you say okay people want to look at seven things at once um, great I can do that I'm an artist I can make seven things that are like flashing at once no problem <laughs> Hi there. Um, I guess my question is more so for Mr. Tom Block, is it? Um, but what, are the, what do you feel that the qualities are that set activists are apart from being biased and that gives the art the power to infiltrate and cause change as opposed to, say, like a shutout effect of, say, like a, a bigot that was mentioned earlier? And, and how can an artist approach their work in a way where it can be more well-rooted in change rather than causing, you know, rather than feeling skeptic skeptic about it and say more confident in the sense that it's going to have that change and and how can one be sure to keep these qualities when say putting them into um, modern media and trying to affect the uh, popular culture how many questions was that okay just I'm gonna pretend it was one I'm gonna pretend it was one question um, I mean how I think you have to do this. The same thing is look at your art as a means, and and just you create it as an end. But once it's done, you look at it as something you're going to use to activate. And whatever it takes, whether it means putting it in bathrooms, whether it means trying to get the media interested. I mean, Kim's like all over the media. Fantastic. That's going to do a lot more for these ideas than the show. So the show just becomes a way to activate the media. Maybe, it's, maybe the show is not an end in itself. Maybe only 50 people see the show itself while 7,000 people see it on TV and they get an idea of it in all these different ways. So you ha I think you have to look at the art. You have to. If you really want to make social change, you have to look at that art as just a spark. And everything else that happens around that is what's as important or even more important, not for you as an artist maybe, but for your idea of, of activating and changing and transforming. You want to get into the places where people, where people ingest reality, and you know that is not in an art gallery. But the art gallery, mm -hmm. as Kim has shown, can provide that initial spark. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's doing an incredible thing, you know, with all this activity. But to my mind, all that activity is more important because that's how you're reaching people. And if it's about reaching people, then you use whatever whatever you can think of. And the same goes for I don't remember your name, but you know, you you find however you can get that stuff out there. Show in a public library. You know, I mean, whatever is going to reach people. I mean, I think you really have to get over looking at your art as an end, because if you don't, then you will just be preaching to the choir and speaking to small groups of people in galleries. Sorry for the length there. So, me too. I'm sorry I was so long. <laughs> uh, first, I really want to clarify something because I was talking earlier, talking earlier about um, I mentioned installation and video art, and I. Um, I really want to be clear that the work that I'm talking about that I feel so disengaged from when I see it and I'm p totally willing to take time to spend time with art is I don't even I can't even come up with an artist's name but it's like walking in and, and seeing a bunch of television sitting on the floor with just a rolling screen of bands of color that just doesn't speak to me your video <laughs> installation spoke very strongly to me um, so when I'm mentioning new genre art, I certainly should have 
chosen my words more carefully because I'm not indicting it um, broadly, but so much of what I see in new genre I have, I feel no connection to whatsoever. I have to also say though that walking through galleries in Chicago and New York, uh, probably 80 to 90 percent of what I see in more traditional realms, I, I, I can't connect with that either. So I, I guess it's just sort of a, a broad indictment in general. <laughs> <laughs> And I also wanted to briefly say that, uh, Tom, I, you had mentioned earlier something about um, people not engaging with uh, books and paintings anymore, and I really, really, really disagree with that. I, I think people continue to very much engage with more traditional mediums, holding a book in their hand and standing in front of a, a, a painting or a drawing or a print and, and having a conversation with it uh, in their minds. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say one thing that, that, I, that I believe, because this is a, a question. By the way, I'm Robert Sheridan, those of you who don't know me. Um, <laughs> this is a question that was asked me several years ago when I was doing a talk someplace. And I thought, what a strange question. And I suddenly realized, you know, art can be, can be just as Im important just because it's beautiful. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Terrifying or, or thought provoking or, 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 or you know, head splitting or body, whatever, because even beautiful art causes change. Mm -hmm. And rolling screens of color, that sounds fun to me, uh, Deborah. I don't know, but. <laughs> I but can sit in my living room with my rabbit ear <laughs> antenna and lock, look at my TV and see that. I don't need so, to be in a gallery. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, uh, whatever turns you out. But anyway, uh, you know, beautiful. Beauty. There's nothing wrong with beauty. Uh, what do you think? I mean, you know, th why not? Different ideas of beauty. Am, am, am I, am I, I know I'm an art historian. I, haven't, I don't remember anything after 1965. Am I that far out of date? <laughs> <laughs> this is a really nice Dave Hickey piece on this precise subject, right? Enter the Dragon, talking about, like, nobody likes beauty anymore. It's out of fashion. But then goes on to talk about how precisely because beauty has this sort of, like, engaging quality, it's a great hook to bring folks in. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, in some ways, be more political and more kind of direct with, you know, what you're trying to say strategically if it looks pretty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Well, uh. What's beautiful is the truth. Many of the slides we saw there were beautiful because they were true, but the truth was harsh. You understand what I, I mean? It, it, they, it wasn't like looking, it wasn't a walk across a meadow. Most of that stuff, <laughs> but it was but it was beautiful. Go ahead, Diane. <laughs> um, I've been making also some notes. I guess a couple comments, um, and to to I guess have other comments. The idea of the infiltration aspect that that kind of keeps talk coming up is. Um, one thing that was interesting was that uh, we talked about, you know, preaching to the choir as we typically do as artists. And I'm an artist for a long time and changing careers and doing all kinds of things with art at the moment. But um, I wonder, we are preaching to the choir, yes. But what I'm finding is, and some of this is personally based also, one who's been a member of the arts community for, you know, God knows when, since I was first started drawing, I would guess. Um, and also being a lesbian, I, even in the gay movement, could be a sympathetic, um, personal view of that. But it's really taken a lot of seeing a lot of other oppression by a lot of other groups to really get me to begin to move actively. So I guess my thing is, is, is preaching to the choir because someone is sympathetic to that cause, is that engaging that energy that we're talking about to get those people to not only be sympathetic to the cause, but to move out and talk to other people and do things actively and create an energy that makes move and makes change. So I had that comment. And I have noticed another thing that's, that's happening. Um, I'm doing a lot of what I would call worship art in terms of doing some things at my church. I'm really involved in spirituality and art. My goal is I am uh, going into art therapy. Now, I'm using these 
paintings that I'm doing at church, both as my own personal spiritual enrichment, but I'm also trying to make awareness about the power of art to heal. And I'm getting people that are coming in and they're asking, and this is where this thing about the sellability of art and is that the point of the art? And it depends on what the person wants to get out of it. Or is it the events that happen around it that ripple and change effect? I'm getting people that go, oh, well, aren't you selling those? Those are really cool. Are those for sale? <laughs> no. Why? Why aren't they for sale? I'm interested in showing people that anyone can do art and that art can be healing and it's about that and I will show this work and I will talk about it, but it has, it has an energy outside of itself. Not that I wouldn't necessarily ever sell something, but I guess the, the thing is, you know, thinking about the different ways that things can create energies, whether it's the choir or it's the event or it's the talking to someone else and that ripple effect. I'd like to redefine the choir Maybe in, in response to that. Um, when I think about preaching to the choir, I don't necessarily think about the choir being people who are sympathetic to my beliefs. But I'm thinking of the choir as those people who are sympathetic to art. In other words, we're all here as art lovers. We've already had, we've, we've come here with the assumption that art is a good thing. And we appreciate it and we know about it. Um, but there are, there's a huge percentage of people out there for whom art is a little weird. Uh, art has really no meaning in their lives. Uh, and I think that's, that's the non-choir that we need to get to. That's the public uh, that, that we get to placing our art in bathrooms and in, in bus stations. Um, so I think we have to look beyond just the, the political agreement. But those people who agree or disagree with art in general. And I think one way that that's happening is in fact a return to traditional art. Uh, many postmodern artists are returning to the beauty of classical art. Uh, they're infusing their work with glazing and traditional oil paints with, with uh, detailed realism simply because it's a hook for a lot of people who don't understand uh, the more modern abstraction and, and some of the postmodern conceptual pieces. You know, this person has talent. Uh, the, 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 this particular artist is a skilled craftsperson. And so that may be the way that we hook that audience that doesn't understand art uh, and get them to appreciate the beauty and then go beyond that to the political statement or the activist change. I'm really intrigued by, by Tom's concept, and I may be abusing it, but infiltration and insinuation, it's, it's given me a lot to think about. Um, as, a, as a person who's only becoming visually oriented, as a person who's primarily language driven, uh, my question is for Larry. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the power of art to create some kind of transformation. Larry and his wife Cheryl, who's sitting right here, just recently directed a play and could you talk a little bit about, I mean, it's, well, about that. Uh, well, we were invited to uh, direct a teenage musical in uh, Midlands um, Community Theater. We decided we would do Fiddler on the Roof. And in the uh, opening read around with our 56 member cast, mostly high school and college, uh, we also asked them, what do you know or think you know about the world of this play? And then we also asked them, what would be useful to know so that you could be a better performer and that this production might be all it can be? We weren't sure what they would say. They said a lot. There were a lot of things they, they thought they knew that were on target or way off target. You know, really not much knowledge of the, the history of that. And, uh, but their questions were very sincere and very profound. And so in addition to, you know, the usual kind of theater things, the, the blocking and the reading of lines and the characterization, we realized you can't separate those things. This is not really a play that exists apart from history, apart from a, a particular culture. I mean, I, I'm sure you can put it on without any of that. But uh, I suppose there was something transformative there that went on, Alan. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the work that Cheryl and I did with Artevia, who was a high school boy 
And, uh, you know, in addition to the regular rehearsals with the whole cast, we met with him most afternoons. And we just did what you do with actors, you know. You went over and over and over the scenes and the lines. And one afternoon, weeks into rehearsal, uh, Joey <laughs> looked at us all of a sudden. And he started to say some things about his understanding of Tevye. And, uh, you know, he, he's, um, he's not just funny. He started to talk. And uh, I, I wish I could play the tape of what exactly he said at that point. But we just let him talk for a while. And when he finished, I don't remember exactly what we said in response, but it was the equivalent of um, bingo. <laughs> that if you get that, then you are far more in tune with um, what Sholem Aleichem had in mind when he wrote those stories back around 1890. Living in that world, they are not really funny. They are, but they aren't. And there's an awful lot of underlying sadness and seriousness. And um, so, you know, for, for Joe to do what he had to do, he couldn't just memorize the lines and spit them back. He could do that. But that we wanted much more than that from Joe. So um, I'm not sure if this is answering your question, Alan, but I think it does come back a little bit to maybe what you were suggesting. Transformation occurs one by one by one by one. We couldn't just work with 56 people. We did. There were things we did with all of them, but we had to take Tevye aside and Gold aside. Even the constable, the Russian constable, you know, who are you? What role do you play? Uh, at one point, in early in rehearsal, he kind of um, leans forward and pats Tevye on the back, and I said, I don't think in this production we're going to make him that friendly. Uh, we're going to give him some hum On the other hand, on the other hand, we talked about this too. On the other hand, he's probably more sympathetic than a lot of folks would have been. Um, our choreographer uh, wanted to have the, um, the Orthodox priest introduced in the very opening number uh, enter and go over to the rabbi and they would exchange bows. Uh, I didn't realize that had been the choreographer's decision. So one night late in rehearsal when I saw that, uh, I just took the priest aside and I said, no, we're not going to do it that way. You're going to come on. You're going to walk right past Tevi along with the constable. You are going to make no gesture to the rabbi. And fine with him. The next time he went on stage during one of our dress rehearsals, he did that. And boy, did I have the choreographer in my face at that time. How dare you make a change without consulting me and so on. I didn't realize it was her change. And I, I, but I did say to her, this wouldn't have happened. This just never would have happened. And it's not at all true to what we're trying to get across in this, in this play. Um, one of the brightest people in the cast, a, a boy who just graduated and went off to college with top grades and lots of scholarships and so on. When he first found out we were doing Fiddler, we, you know, I don't know that he knew we were directing it, but we've directed him in lots of plays. But his first comment was, yeah, but it's so sad. You know, like I thought, well, you're right. You know, it's not Little Abner. It's not like a lot of musicals. So... <clears throat> Sorry, I have a really, really quick question. I was just wondering, um, and this is the entire panel, um, what about uh, with, with contemporary artists uh, and this in intense commodification of their art? Uh, you mentioned uh, Carl Walker, and she's extremely uh, 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 viable, uh, very interesting. I mean, a lot of people, I'm sure, are buying art in America, that issue, just because she's on the cover. And I was wondering, uh, how does that... Uh, the viability of the artist, how does that, uh, does it help their art and their message, especially because her message is so controversial, or does it ultimately hinder? That's my question. You're speaking specifically about whether, if the artist is commodified, does that help or hinder the message if it's easily purchased? Well, um, not just uh, that, uh, I was thinking more along the lines of um, the, the mixing of fine art and mass media uh, that we see in contemporary art in general, uh, and does it cheapen art? Does it make it less of, art is becoming less and less an object of reverence and more and more, you know, on the cover of a magazine? And does it take away from the art or does it empower the art? It depends on the art. <laughs> But in the case of Kara Walker, who is obviously very, uh, her message is very controversial, I think having her work reproduced on the cover of Art in America 
uh, certainly gives the work more exposure. And I don't, I don't think it cheapens it. I think um, in this particular instance, it's a really well-written article that presents both, both sides of, of the story, um, the side of those that are criticizing her work and her take on it. And um, I think it has the potential to interest people in seeing work that they might not otherwise know is out there. If it was, you know, um, so I, I guess in general, I don't think that art magazines or periodicals specifically cheapen any artwork. Although I have to say that when you see a reproduction that's two by three inches of a complex installation in video, I think, why bother? I can't, I, get, I can garner absolutely nothing from this reproduction, so why is it even in the magazine? Yeah. But that's another issue. Exactly, especially like with her the, work.